Hi there. Welcome to our presentation today. I'm Frank Hanna, Joint CEO of the business, uh, and I'm joined by our new CFO, Brian Marnie. Um, so in terms of today's presentation, we're going to touch on who we are, what we do, uh, run through our 2020 financial highlights, um, talk through the 2020 operational highlights, um, touch on COVID a little bit, talk about the market structure and its fundamentals, uh, and then conclude at the end with our outlook and, and then take some questions. Um, but before we do that, um, let me hand over to Ryan so he can tell you a bit about his background and where he comes from and, and um, his fit within the business. Right. Hey, thanks, Frank, and good morning, everybody. Um, I just want to say I'm, I'm delighted to, to join the business. Um, Mickle Mersh is very well managed, uh, market leading brick specialist, um, and yeah, very excited to join a growing organization. Um, I also want to take the opportunity to thank Steve Morgan. Um, before his departure, we had some good hand over time, um, and yeah, took my appointment at the AGM. Um, was yeah, very exciting, and I'm really looking forward to the challenge. I've joined from Avon Robbo, where I was deputy CFO. Avon was very focused on organic growth and delivering sort of value enhancements through uh, strong acquisitions, and was very focused on having a strong balance sheet. Um, absolutely focused as well, it's now joined uh, Michael Mersh. Steve left a very well-managed finance function, and I was very fortunate to inherit a very strong balance sheet and very strong cash position. Um, I'm very much looking forward to joining Frank and Peter and taking the business forward and growing in line with the board's expectations. Many thanks, and with that, I'll pass back to Frank. Thanks, Ryan. We're very much a premium-centric company in the sector, and we're operating at about 30% price premium to the rest of the industry, and that's because of our market position and our offering to the marketplace. All our plants are uniquely different in their offering and what they do and what they produce in terms of volumes. And the chart at the bottom there shows you what they produce and the dots correspond to where they are located. So we make around 123 million diverse premium centric products every year. We've got a very strong core market. We're not wedded to any one particular market. So we cover RMI, some housing, commercial, we do some social housing, we do urban regeneration, we do specification work with architects and designers. <clears throat> and we try and make sure our assets have three lifetime revenue sources. And that is we produce bricks from the mineral. We then uh, have the restitution landfill of the land, or when appropriate, we will spin off some pieces of investment land. So if you look through some of our um, uh, RNSs, you can see that if appropriate, um, we want to crystallize again on a piece of land that we no longer need, we will do that. We have a very strong, robust distribution policy with a pioneering select order process. We only deal through distribution. We don't deal directly with house builders, et cetera. So we try and be the darlings of distribution, if you like. And as I alluded to, we're margin focused, not market share focused. We've got about 5%, 6% of the UK market currently. And also it's worth noting we have an industry leading BIM Bricks brand. And this is online data and files that we use to give to architects and designers to help them design their buildings and products and visions, if you like. So I suppose when I say premium, the best way to describe this is think of uh, washing machines would be the best analogy. We are really Miele, Siemens, Gaggenau. That's where we try and position ourselves within the marketplace. Um, and our trajectory in terms of um, where we want to be is premium centric. We don't tend to do too much middle ground or lower end stuff. So despite the COVID situation, the team worked incredibly hard under very, very difficult circumstances to deliver quite a reasonable year, all things considered. We saw a strong financial and operational performance during the year. And this has continued into the first quarter of 2021, as was noted in the AGM, and positively turnover and gross margin were comparable to 2019. We had a very strong cash position, leading to a net cash position by the end of the year. And we decided to pay HSBC, our banking partner, back a significant part of our loan facility. And we did this early. And we ensured a balanced response for all our stakeholders. And, and that means, you know, we wanted to return to progressive dividend stream. We felt it was important to pay the furlough money and we wanted to enhance our welfare support for all of our staff. And they were key things that we wanted to achieve during the year. It's also important to note that the group order book on a like-for-like -like basis was 21% ahead of the same period 
last year. So let's quickly go through the headline numbers for 2020. Now, what we've done, if you have a look in grey in the smaller numbers, we put the 2019 comparatives in. 2019 was a record year for the growing group. So if we look at the 2020 numbers in terms of turnover, it's 52 million with an underlying gross margin of 41.3%. Underlying EBIT was 8.8 million and underlying EBITDA 12.3. Our reported PBT was 6.9 million and our cash flow from operations was 12.9. Underlying EPS, 6.28 pence. And as I just alluded to, dividend at the midpoint of this year, 2.5p. And pleasingly, the net asset value went up to 84.8p. Now, moving on to the operational side of the business, despite COVID-19 and the impact of it, the business didn't stand still. And the team worked really, really hard. And the most important thing really in all of this is that we and managed to achieve a COVID-safe status across all of our factories. Um, we closed for a small period of time. It was around four, four weeks, roughly. So we lost just over a month's worth of production. And it was difficult to get that back. Um, but all our factories have been operating on full capacity for some time. And if you have a look at the graph at the bottom, that graph highlights the speed of our recovery in the sector and our attempts to make back the deficit throughout the year. So... Within the year, we were able to complete new offices at our Florin factory in Belgium, where we built a new welfare and technical testing building. We also put in some new setting equipment, which were used to improve the efficiency of the plant and the throughput of the plant. Importantly, we formed a new sustainability net zero steering committee. We recruited Ryan as the new CFO to replace Steve, and the handover has been seamless. And I think that's been testament to the skill set of both Steve, but also, you know, Ryan's skill set and the attributes that he's brought to the role. To the role, we elevated key staff um, through 2020 and implemented an enhanced management structure that was important. And we made investment to secure future mineral reserves within the business, and we did this in two ways. Firstly, we have a road at our Blockley plant in Telford, which we're looking to move, and this will give us access to other to extra mineral. And then we exercised an option on some mineral land down at our Michelmarsh plant down in Romsey. So just talking through the market structure, this gives you a snapshot of where the current market is. We have 50 plants in the UK and we have currently about 1.9, 1.95 billion output. And industry stock at the moment is around 300 million. The UK market is highly concentrated. And as I alluded to earlier, we are operating at a bit of a premium. The, the bar chart at the bottom shows you who's got what in terms of plants. To give you a bit of a history lesson, if you go back to 2008, prior to the 2009-2010 recession, there were around 84 plants in the UK. Um, the UK had a capacity of around just over 3 billion bricks. Um, we had stock of a billion, uh, and we were bringing in some imports. Um, and at that time, um, we were consuming about 2.6, 2.7 billion bricks in total. We went through the recession, many plants closed, and we're now in a position where we have these 50 plants producing around 1.9, 1.95 billion bricks. Stock, industry stock is very, very low. It's around 300 million at the moment. And we bring in bricks from Europe, predominantly Belgium and Holland, because that is the other key epicenter of brick making, if you like. So the sector is consuming three to four hundred billion bricks from the European sector, if you like. So in terms of fundamentals and marketplace, it's worth noting that the government very much see construction as a weapon in their financial arsenal to help reignite the post-COVID economy. So there's many initiatives that we welcome, for example, the stamp duty holidays, the help to buy extension, you know, the, the, the planning reforms. These are all very good, helpful initiatives. Um, the CPA forecasts strong housing projections for 21 and 22. And again, market fund fundamentals remain supportive, and these are underpinned by the UK housing deficit. Um, government policies and, and low interest rates. I think infrastructure spend will be a key area of government investment over the medium term. And also one needs to look at uh, build to rent and some of the restitution work that needs to be done on some of the existing high rise housing stock we've got at the moment. Mortgage availability remains pretty good and interest rates remain quite favourable. And we have this drive for increased social housing and affordable new homes. We can see, I think if you track back over 20 years, you can see this disconnect between housing completions and housing formations. Housing completions have never really managed to catch up with the housing formations every year. And I suppose this 
has driven this shortage of new housing. And this is where this long term underbuilding has come from. I think modular construction techniques are a key feature in the built rent sector. We're looking at that as a growing proposition. And I think also there's this post-COVID-19 housing demand bounce that we've seen throughout various parts of the country as people spread and migrate further around the UK and probably are looking at being less city-centric, if you like. We're also seeing enhanced working from home, and this is stimulating our RMI revenue because people are doing uh, improving, you know, home offices and doing home improvements, putting extensions on. And this is improving our RMI opportunity through our builders' merchants, again, alongside our ageing housing stock. So these are all factors and drivers in terms of driving our RMI position. So how do we see the short to medium term outlook? I think you've got continued constrained UK market capacity, as I alluded to earlier. We've got industry stocks at very low levels, and that's been driven by the recent sector restructuring with some plants being closed. I think you need to have a look at the barriers to entry. Very, very complex to put down a new brick factory. They're extremely expensive. You've got um, environmental impact assessment, traffic surveys. Is the land fit for purpose? Um, and you're looking at a spend in the region of 600,000 to a million pounds per million bricks of output. So that gives you a sense of how much one needs to spend to put a new brick factory down. And this is why when you look at ourselves and some of the others, they are spending money on refurbishing and improving existing factories and facilities that they've got. And again, we've got this continued demand for residential development and and the backdrop of the strong RMI. And for us as a group, in terms of the rest of this year and going forward into next, it's quite a positive outlook. Um, Our performances continue to be robust. Our production volumes are where we want them to be and slightly ahead of expectations. Um, And we're very much on track to meet full year expectations. Um, We want to capitalise on the recent success of our enhanced geography with the acquisition of Florin in Belgium and look at other opportunities there. We want to ensure robust, strong cash generation through the conversion of the strong order book during the second half of the year. And as I said, you know, we are not overly exposed to any one particular sector. We're well balanced through our RMI housing, social housing, commercial, and uh, specification work. And it's important to keep that balance within the order book um, as it de-risks your uh, portfolio to a certain extent. And also we feel it's important to reward shareholders and return to a balanced, strong, progressive dividend stream. And I think that highlights the board's belief in our strong cash generation position. We want to push the Telford Road project through as quickly as we can. Um, and this will release, as I said earlier, release the long-term mineral there. And then we're going to continue to focus on capital projects that enhance the efficiency of output across the group. And, you know, as we said, you know, we put new setting equipment in at Florin. Uh, we did put a new packing line in at, um, over the last few years, new packing line in at um, our carbon plant. So wherever we can, we will try and deploy CapEx that will slightly improve the output and increase our efficiency. And this is an ongoing rolling thing that we have all the time on the drawing board. We are going to explore new opportunities that complement our current business strategy post the Florin acquisition. And I think in the current environment, it's it's important to continue the CapEx spend and focus on CRM and e-commerce and our IT, et cetera. We've enhanced and increased the size of our IT department. Um, We've bought some new software modules, um, which are now live this month. Uh, we're looking to enhance servers, et cetera. So, you know, we are embracing um, e-commerce, if you like, and I think there's an awful lot of opportunity there for us as a business to try and um, improve the efficiency in the way that we work and how we interact with our customer base and stakeholders through our IT. So that's pretty much everything. Um, I know it's a, a, a brief summary of our full uh, 2020 presentation but i think we're happy to take some um questions if you if you'd like we have one question could you define what rmi means that's repairs maintenance and improvements so it's basically uh, people doing extensions or repurposing offices or um anything where you're remediating an existing building um also you could cover off 
uh, examples such as landscaping, you know, where we sell landscaping products for garden designers and things like that, because we obviously do paving bricks and things, all car parks, that sort of thing. Thank you. Um, given the supply deficit in the UK, do you plan any additional significant capex for expansion in the premium sector? And what's your view on productivity increases at the existing sites? We are always looking at new opportunities where we can expand our existing production. Um, but I think it's a it, it needs to work for the business and needs to work for the location. If we're able to, we will look at that and do that. And we have been very successful at doing that in the past, Um, but it's got to be right for the sector. Um, And it takes a bit of planning and takes some time to bring it to fruition, bring it to market. It's not a quick thing to do, it's quite complex. Each, as I said, each of the sites are uniquely different. So um, it's easier to improve our efficiency uh, at our more automated plants um, and that's something we do on an ongoing basis all the time and we will be deploying capital to one improve our output where we can and, and to improve the efficiency of those plants. Thank you and do you think there will be any Brexit related problems in importing bricks from the low countries potentially tightening the UK brick market? We bring product in from our Belgian plant. We have had a few issues, okay, um, and they have namely been around haulage um, and haulage paperwork, um, predominantly paperwork. But over the last two months, that position has been improving. So we saw a spike in the haulage prices um, straight after Brexit, but that's starting to cool off now and that's starting to come down to more normalised levels as everybody gets used to the new processes and um, new ways of working. So I think that risk has diminished somewhat and we're finding the flow of product far more um, easy to manage, if you like. Thank you. And how different or unique are Michelmerge bricks versus peers? What proportion of your brick stock would you say is truly differentiated? Um, It's really very much down to colours and textures. Um, You have to remember that many of the brands that we've got are generations old uh, in the same way that some of our peer groups are. Um, And they're unique in the way that they fire and they perform and how they fit into the built environment. Um, It used to be very much local bricks for local marketplaces. So I think if you look at some of the colours and some of the textures we produce compared to others in the sector, um, they are going into probably um, mid to high sector homes. Um, we do do some social housing, but quite complex architecturally driven um, projects. So I think it, it's very much the way that the product looks um, and that finished result of the end elevation and that finished facade, if you like. Thank you. There's lots of discussion on rising energy costs. How do you see the balance of your price rises versus these cost increases? We hedge energy as much as we possibly can. We're not energy traders, so we set our budget out for the year, we'll have a look at it, and then the team with Peter will have a look at the candlesticks, see where energy is for next month or maybe two years out, and then we will take a view and buy if it's under budget as much as we possibly can. But however, we do see some headwinds with energy because, um, you know, energy prices were quite favourable to the last two years. Um, And I think the world dynamics are changing and I think we will see a rise in energy costs, no doubt about it. Thank you. And do you have sufficient mineral reserves and f- how far ahead are you planning in order to maintain necessary stocks for the future? Uh, we've got over 500 acres within the group. When you look at each of their plants, they're all uniquely different. As I said, the mineral reserves are different at each plant. So um, our planning applications run for 20, 25 years. So before we deploy any capex, you know, we want to be sure that we have, say, 25 years of mineral available at that particular plant um, before we will spend the money to, you know, significantly enhance production capabilities. And that's the normal standard thing. Um, some plants we've got 50 years and beyond. Um, some plants we have slightly less. But, you know, as and when we have a parcel of land that we don't need anymore, we will crystallise again and sell that off into the, into, the, into the marketplace. And we did that recently up at 
Telford, at Block Cleaser, we had a piece of land we didn't need, we sold that to Bogus. And if you look in our RNSs, um, our Dunton plant, we'd come to the end of that life cycle for that plant because we'd extracted all the mineral and we sold that plant um, to a waste operator. So uh, we like to have a good, strong, solid land bank, and then that gives us options, you know, and we always, if we can, uh, if need be, we'll try and um, acquire more land where appropriate. Thank you. And if you were to announce a new brick factory, how long would it take for the new factory to be fully functioning? Around, to, to my mind, you're looking at a 48 month, 36 to 48 month process um, from a clean sheet of paper drawing board through to finished design and then bringing bricks to the marketplace. There's a lot of complexities to it in terms of you've got uh, traffic surveys, environmental impact assessment, section 106, planning, mineral reserves, um, commissioning of the plant, building the building, it, it, the, the list is absolutely endless. Uh, and it's a significant level of capex to deploy. So if you have a look at um, Forterra and Ipstock, you know, they both spent significant sums recently um, improving uh, some of their plants and, and putting some new, you know, you know look at the new Desert plant facility, you know, it's a fantastic um, cam shot of that as, as it's progressing, you know, uh, the timeline shot, you know, it, it, it is quite capex hungry to do and takes time to do it properly. So you need strong long-term mineral reserves before you commit that level of money. But in answer to your question, you're looking at a 36 to 48 month gestation period and deep pockets. Thank you. And how much of your bricks are sold to smaller house builders versus the bigger name publicly listed house builders? Uh, quite a few, and they tend to go through our builders' merchants, our regional and national builders' merchants, such as Travis Burke Institutions, the H, if we're not happy, um, through to the smaller independents. Um, we deal with a lot of listed companies, for example, Crest Homes are the customer, we do a lot of people like Barclays. Um, and then we do more bespoke, one off high end projects, and we've got a lot of self builders. And a lot of the self builders are buying their product through the builders and merchants. So we'll deliver product into a builder's merchant's yard and then they'll come in and pick up for whatever scheme they're doing or their house. So um, we do do a fair bit of that. And it's interesting because people are becoming slightly more discerning in terms of when they're building a new house, they're starting to look at the external elevations, they're spending a bit more on the brickwork and, you know, going back to more traditional brickwork because, you know, the sustainability and um, longevity and how it looks and there's no maintenance. There's so many attributes that are, are positive with brick. So um, we do very well in that sector in that space. Um, and, and again, we also deal with smaller one-off house builders that are building two, three, four units a year. It's, it's um, bread and butter business for us. Thank you. And there have been discussions on shortages of mortar in the UK. Has this impacted the demand level for bricks because they just can't be laid? I think it's caused some problems on some sites in terms of build build programs and how sites are uh, trying to get completions done. But at the moment, from our perspective, in terms of demands and call-offs for our products for direct to site, we haven't seen an impact yet. Thank you. And do you think the government's planning ambitions will significantly change the number of new homes built in the UK over the next decade? <laughs> Possibly. Um, I think think that if you look at our entire sector, um, I, I think to get to 250,000 new homes will be a huge achievement. And I think if you go back to the days of PPG3, when we were, you know, 2006, I maybe we were building a lot of apartments, what have you, I think um, the most we did then was around the 220 mark. Um, and our average for five years preceding 2008 was around 194,000 new homes. So um, I think 300,000 is ambitious. I'd be delighted if they hit it. Thank you. In terms of your order book, how is it split between RMI and new housing? Uh, the split tends to be, it's about 50-50 really, to be honest with you. Um, I think if you lump new build and new housing into one part, 50% and RMI, um, and some self builders into, into, the, into the other half. That's probably about the best way to describe the split. In the summer months when the sites are very, very busy, 
it will probably tend to swing a little bit more towards, in terms of deliveries, more towards sites and housing. And then uh, for the peak summer months, because the um, house builders are, you know, ramping up their build programs, um, the RMI tends to be far more consistent in terms of its take throughout the year. Thank you. And has Michelmash benefited from either Ipstock or Futera's recent restructurings? We have a little bit in some areas on some key products, yes, because there's been a, a few shortages whilst they um, improve their output at a couple of their plants and also um, three plants have been mothballed and closed. So, yeah, there, there has been um, some um, all to pick up there from our perspective. Thank you. And that's the end of questions. Frank, do you have any closing remarks? No, not at all, really. I um, just wanted to say thank you for your time and giving us, giving us the opportunity to talk to you um, and look forward to speaking to you again. Yeah, I was just going to say we're, we're due to report our interims in September. Um, and as Frank said earlier, yeah, we've got a very supportive uh, market dynamics at the moment. The trading statement confirmed that we've got a very good balanced order book. Um, and you know that that maintenance and focus on the strong balance sheet, cash generation, um, and we're looking forward to um, delivering those in September. Um, and as we said, um, looking forward to hopefully meeting the shareholder expectations.